Hello and welcome to TechFunnel.com's interview series. My name is Danny White and today we have the opportunity to talk to Thomas Friedel. Chief Product Officer at Merrill Corporation. As Chief Product Officer, Thomas is responsible for all aspects of product management and engineering, including driving product growth and innovation of the company's core product, Data Site One, a global leading platform that powers secure, intelligent due diligence and enterprise collaboration for thousands of deals in more than 170 countries. Data Site One is used by professionals across banking, capital markets, insurance, legal, healthcare, energy, and other global sectors and markets. Thomas has deep leadership experience in finance and technology. Prior to joining Merrill in 2015, he was CEO of Smith Co. Investments. Before that, he was the CTO for several technology and fintech companies, including Snag and Intralinks. Thomas is also an inventor and entrepreneur, and he co-founded and led a SaaS-based company, Cambridge Technology Vision, where he invented, built, and launched the first virtual data room for mergers and acquisitions. A VDR enables businesses to share information during the due diligence process in a secure online space. He also founded Membly, a platform which allows individuals to capture and share memories, including pictures, notes, videos, or audio in a secure and private way. Thomas holds a BA from the University of Virginia in Cognitive Science and an MBA from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania in Finance and Entrepreneurship. Merrill Corporation is a leading global SaaS provider for participants in the mergers and acquisitions industry. The company's platform, Data Site One, powers secure, intelligent due diligence and enterprise collaboration for thousands of deals in more than 170 countries. Welcome, Thomas. Thanks for joining us today. Well, Danielle, nice to meet you, and thanks so much. All right. Well, we'll jump right into it. Um, Merrill has been around for quite a long time. Um, how has the company maintained being on the cutting edge of innovation within the M&A space? Well, we handle about 20% of global deal volume on an annual basis at Merrill on our data site platform. So mm -hmm. we're in constant communication with our customers, uh, more so than uh, anyone else. That constant communication with customers allows us to see the pain points and any of the inefficiencies that are present in the M&A life cycle. Okay, awesome. So how did Merrill get off into the SaaS um, environment and divest its product lines to become a pure service company? Uh, well, uh, you know, originally, uh, Merrill, the company, has been around for, for 50 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, initially, the mix of uh, business included things like uh, financial printing, marketing, and communications. And, uh, you know, what, what happened is uh, the needs, the customer demands for uh, some of those legacy businesses, you know, really shrank over time. Uh, so people looking for a contract uh, conference space, for example, uh, something that they used to get from uh, financial printers. The need for that uh, went away, but the demand for technology uh, and for things that would make uh, mergers and acquisitions uh, more efficient uh, mm -hmm. has only continued to increase over time. Uh, so for us, uh, we made this uh, deliberate decision to divest ourselves of those product lines that represented uh, you know, those old things that customers used to look for and really focus all of our energy on the uh, technology solutions that customers want in order for them to be competitive in a ever faster moving environment. So, so we, we made this decision to uh, get rid of those old businesses and really put all of the energy into software as a service, uh, which has uh, enabled us to build something that we think is unique in terms of the, the value that it brings to our customer base. Awesome. So the company's digital transformation journey over the past several years has really been incredible. Um, what are some of the logical steps that you've taken to grow your service offerings? Yeah, so uh, what we did is uh, we, we went from uh, being in a situation where, uh, you know, we had this mix of products, some of which were legacy. You know, mm -hmm. we, we were... Um, you know, our perspective was we have to sanitize this. Let's get rid of uh, some of the legacy. We did that through divestiture. And, uh, and we did that, you know, through uh, focusing our time and attention, you know, on the new, you know, what customers really cared about, what they were uh, asking us for. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so uh, after getting rid of the old, we put together a, uh, uh, a product uh, vision for the new, for where we could go. 
Uh, we got alignment at a board level, uh, executive sponsorship and uh, funding in order to uh, put you know, the energy into uh, the SaaS offerings. And, uh, and really uh, went through this transformation where, uh, you know, we, we built up a, a you know, a new organization, got a, new a lot of new talent uh, involved with this and uh, delivered against, you know, this uh, business and uh, technology vision mm -hmm. by uh, hiring those people, building new architecture uh, and uh, building a new product uh, on that architecture with the goal of adding uh, additional products over time all oriented towards the future, you know, what customers are looking for as opposed to what they used to want. As a product leader, what are some of the suggestions that you would give to uh, other product leaders in perhaps switching from a type of monolithic platform to something more like the Pivotal Cloud and how they might guide their teams um, on that transition or change within their company? Yeah, so, uh, you know, ultimately it's all about uh, speed and growth. You know, mm -hmm. the things that you do, what's the business impact of, uh, of what you do? Uh, you know, we, we believe that if we uh, had an engine of innovation that allowed us to serve customer needs uh, faster and better, uh, that that would help to drive our business. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, if you, if you look at the outcome, and then I'll circle back on how we, on how we got there. If you look at the outcome, we delivered a new product platform in uh, March of last year, and within 90 days, we had more than 90% of our new business on that platform, which is absolutely amazing. You know, yeah, we're talking the world seven, eight fields, and you know, to get that incredible rapid adoption was just just stunning. Mm -hmm. And uh, and what we've seen is uh, it's actually increased our uh, market share. So we've gone from like uh, our estimate was about 11% uh, M&A market share, global M&A market share. 20% uh, global M&A market share. So, so the outcome has been really amazing. And mm -hmm. the way that we got there was, um, you know, really, uh, as we thought about uh, the technology, the problem with monolithic systems is that they just get harder and harder to change over time. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like, uh, you know, it's like the knee bone is connected to the elbow bone. That, you know, when I say that, obviously that makes no sense. Mm -hmm. But the problem is that you end up having these dependencies and ties between things. So uh, with a monolithic architecture, it typically uh, comes tightly coupled system components. And when things are tightly coupled, that means that they become brittle and they become hard to change. And they become hard to change because when you make a change, it has unforeseen and inadvertent consequences. Right. It's also hard to scale up a monolithic architecture because... Uh, you know, kind of everything is in one pot. So, uh, every, you know, everything is in one, one place. So there are parts of the system that may have really spiky demands or may have very growing demands. And then there are other parts of a system that, that, that don't necessarily. And, uh, you know, parts of, of a system may have uh, different, like database demands, storage demands. So, uh, you know, the way we thought about this is, uh, number one, we want to partition the system so it doesn't get too complicated. And we want to make it loosely coupled. So for us, that meant microservices architecture. And, and as we thought about that microservices architecture, we, and we thought to ourselves, well, how do we make this easy, easy to manage? Um, you know, we selected uh, Pivotal, Pivotal Cloud Foundry as our infrastructure mm -hmm. for supporting and building our uh, microservices. Uh, so uh, what that allowed us to do is to keep individual components of our system simple. Mm -hmm. It allowed, allowed us to reuse those things. So for example, one of the functions that we have on our platform is the ability to uh, watermark a document. And with a microservice architecture, it's very easy to build that service once and then to reuse it for different product offerings that we have. Right. That's, that's exactly uh, what we've done. And then uh, we can uh, scale it and isolate it and run it independently of other components. So, you know, heaven forbid there's a problem with it. But mm -hmm. if there's a problem with watermarking, there's no impact on other microservices because they're completely isolated. So, you know, a, a hiccup in one does not have an impact on the infrastructure for a different uh, microservice. So, uh, so these are the things, keeping, you know, breaking the platform into these pieces, mm -hmm. keeping it simple. And then uh, there's a lot that we did in terms of uh, test automation and uh, developing a... Uh, continuous integration, continuous deployment pipeline mm -hmm. that allowed us to get new, uh, new product to market and out to our customers uh, quickly. That's awesome. That growth and um, 
transitioning is really something that other uh, companies can learn who are in the similar space. Um, so switching a little bit to um, te the technological aspect, um, I recently read a report from Global Data that suggested artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, and data centers were some of the key drivers behind M&A activity since 2017. How does Merrill um, capitalize on these technologies within the SaaS space? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, AI is, uh, it's, it's uh, you know, if you think about like, uh, I always think about like uh, the, this uh, concept of a hype cycle mm -hmm. and it's so hyped. Uh, I think, you know, what we see today is, is people sprinkle AI uh, on things uh, like it's magic pixie dust. <laughs> right. And it's so incredibly confusing to, to people. I've, I've been in some executive forums on AI and uh, I think most people are trying to wrap their head around what it really <laughs> means. A lot of people, frankly, are confusing it with uh, analytics. Uh, so they, you know, it kind of becomes almost viewed hand in hand with our reporting solutions, um, solutions that generate insight. What it means to us is it means, uh, you know, creating capabilities that deliver, uh, our, our goal, frankly, is to deliver a magical experience to our customer base. That's what we're aiming for. Mm -hmm. Doing intelligent things on, on their behalf, uh, recognizing the nature of the content uh, that they put uh, onto our platform. So uh, when, when we engage with customers, they tell us that there are some very, very time consuming things that they do. For example, uh, redacting content is very time consuming. Uh, they have to redact content. You know, that means that they'll take a document, they'll black out parts of it. Uh, and, and they do that in over 75% of their deals. And, uh, you know, as we've engaged with people about, uh, at least, uh, 60% of deal makers say that that current process redacting this content takes too long. Mm -hmm. So what, when I think about that as an, as an example and tie that back to, uh, M and A, the way that we think about our product roadmap is one, you know, we deliver this uh, base capability to redact, you know, that just makes it easy for you to mark up these documents and organize the redacted, the unredacted version in the context of your M&A deal. Mm -hmm. But then we go beyond that and we think to ourselves, well, gosh, people are facing a tremendous amount of stress around uh, GDPR and they want to make sure that they're not violating uh, GDPR as they expose information to potential buyers. Right. If, if you're in uh, in Europe, you know you're you're worried that you know you you don't want to uh, violate uh, GDPR rules because it's really expensive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> so the way that we think about AI is uh, taking that uh, core base uh, functionality and then making it really compelling and straightforward for scenarios like uh, GDPR by uh, using things like uh, entity recognition to identify that type of content. Uh, automatically within uh, within documents. Mm -hmm. So that, to my mind, is a very practical meat and potatoes use of AI that creates an experience that will save people an immense amount of time. And, and we look at that really through the entire uh, deal uh, life cycle, uh, whether it's uh, preparing content for the deal, uh, organizing information, going from a checklist to an index structure that potential buyers can navigate, uh, or uh, it's uh, you know you're in the midst of the deal and you're trying to figure out where to uh, put your attention because you've got limited time and, and windows for deals are ever tightening. You know there's mm -hmm. no one that wants an M and A deal to take longer. Uh, everyone is trying to move faster on uh, deals. Absolutely, absolutely, very interesting. Um, so we're interested to know um, what are some of the upcoming solutions or new service offerings that Miro has planned for the market? Yeah, so <coughs> our point of view <coughs> is that uh, we're, we're really going after the uh, major due diligence problems that deal makers uh, face. So mm -hmm. we engage with them often and uh, some of the biggest problems that we hear from them are uh, administrative time, uh, the amount of time it takes to organize information, uh, put it together, uh, expose the right information to the right uh, buyers, uh, redacting, redacting content. Mm -hmm. uh, when they redact, you know, they may redact for buyers, they may redact for uh, other purposes, uh, for the funding aspects of the deal, the financing aspects of the deal. Uh, 
uh, as, uh, as they think about their success, anything that would give them a predictive view of how uh, things are likely to uh, play out mm -hmm. uh, and, and uh, being ready for regulators. These are all key aspects, uh, key problems that dealmakers face today. So uh, for us, uh, we, we make uh, investments on an ongoing basis to continue to uh, not only add capability to address those four items and more in our existing uh, product offerings, we look at uh, how we can uh, extend our value uh, throughout the uh, full life cycle of the M&A process. Uh, so we'll be adding additional product offerings in, you know, in addition to what we have today uh, that continue to uh, focus on and address the needs of deal makers so we can help them to get to their best outcome uh, as fast and as well as, as possible. That's awesome. Thank you so much for joining us today, Thomas. We really do appreciate your time and for sharing all the um, good insights and information about Mural and um, about your services and um, offerings. Really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good rest of your day. You too. Bye. Bye-bye.